Good evening. Welcome to the Bennington Select Board's meeting for November 23rd, 2020. I'm Donald Campbell, the chair of this board, and I'd like to ask the board members to please introduce themselves, starting with you, Bruce. Hi, this is Bruce Lee Clark. Welcome to the meeting. Hi, I'm Jean Connor. Good evening, I'm Jeannie Jenkins. Good evening, this is Jim Carroll. Hi, Sarah Perrin. And also with us tonight, we have our uh, town manager, Stuart Hurd, assistant town manager, Dan Monks. Uh, Josh Boucher from Catamount TV is uh, with us and Nancy Lively taking minutes. So uh, before we start this meeting, I have to read the following. That due to the COVID-19 pandemic state of emergency declared by Governor Scott and pursuant to Addendum 6, Executive Order 1-20, Act 92, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. There is no physical location to attend this meeting. However, the public may view it on CAT TV and call in at 1-646-558-8656 and enter meeting ID 833-0743. 9973 and I'll put that um, put that number up on the screen now. Again, the dial in is 646-558-8656 and the meeting ID is 833-0743-9977. If uh, technology fails us tonight, the meeting will be continued at a time and place to be determined. All votes that are not unanimous will be done with a roll call vote in accordance with the law. So again, uh, meeting ID tonight is 833-0743-9977. If you are calling in for citizens comment, I encourage you to uh, call in. Now we have the um, consent agenda coming up, but we will have public comment right after that. So if you're um, willing, you can call up anytime. You'll be entered into the waiting room after you press pound. And um, once you're in the waiting room, we will admit you into the meeting in the order that you've come in. So again, if you, uh, if you hope to speak at public comment, begin thinking about dialing in now, you'll be in the waiting room for a couple of minutes while we finish up the consent agenda. So the first order of business tonight, is in fact the consent agenda, the minutes of uh, 1029, 11, 9, and 1116, as well as the warrants as circulated. And with the board's permission, I'd like to add to the consent agenda, a second class liquor license for the Hazard Food Mart. Uh, that came out from Beth fairly late this afternoon, but uh, hopefully you all have had a chance to see that. Um, a pretty standard liquor license request. So for the purposes of a uh, of conversation, I guess I'd like a motion on this consent agenda, please. So moved. Thank you, Jean. Do I have a second? second. Thank you, Bruce. Okay, uh, board discussion on the consent agenda. Any Anything on the minutes uh, from October 29th, November 9th, November 16th, the warrants as circulated, if you haven't had a chance to ask Stuart your questions already, or the... Um, for the liquor license that was recently added. No? Okay, well then I guess I would ask everybody to please unmute themselves and uh, all in favor of the consent agenda as circulated and amended, please say aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? Okay, that goes through. On to public comment. It's um, 6.05, public comment runs until um, 6.20, but uh, I did get a comment last week that somebody called in about 10 minutes into public comment and we had already moved on. So not quite sure what to do about that in terms of a meeting agenda item. It's difficult to leave things open, which is why I encourage people to call in ahead of time. I don't see anybody in the... Um, waiting room at this point. And so I'm going to assume that there's no public comment board. Um, if somebody calls in and we can make time later in the meeting, uh, if it's in the next 10 or so minutes, I will try to do that, but I, I'm not quite sure how else to handle it on Zoom. 
it's not a perfect situation, but I will try to um, try to accommodate anybody if they call in in the next 10 minutes. Okay, in the meantime, we're going to move on to community policing reviews. Uh, this is the, uh, the first reading. So if you'll bear with me just for a second, I'm gonna do a little bit of a summary. Um, so following the recommendations uh, set forth in the IACP report that came out earlier this spring, and in, consult in consultation with the town's uh, consultant, Curtis Reed from the Vermont Partnership for Fairness and Diversity, the Select Board's Community Policing Committee, that's Jean and Jeannie and Bruce, developed a process to review, update, create as necessary stated police policies. And so this group has worked through the course of the summer and the fall to develop the recommended policies we see before us tonight. And these are the first three policies to be reviewed by the Policy Advisory Committee and uh, more will follow. So the Policy Advisory Committee included the following community members, Peter Niles, Ricardo Wilson, Allison Levy, Dan Merges. These citizens were joined by Officer Dan Ferreira and Assistant Town Manager Dan Monks, along with Select Board Member Bruce Lee Clark. And we should take a minute to uh, thank the citizens, especially who generously volunteered their time for this effort. It's really great that you were able to give us so much of your time. In addition, we should thank Officer Ferreira and Chief Doucette, both for their professional expertise and for their willingness to engage productively in this process. So a reminder that materials available to the committee and used in their development of these proposals can all be found on the town's website under community policing. If you wanna hear what went into these proposed policies, each meeting was videotaped and can be viewed on CAT TV. The process was roughly this. Following approval from the policy committee, each new or revised policy was sent to Bennington Police Chief Paul Doucette and Town Attorney Rob Wilmington for review. So we'll have a first reading tonight at which I welcome, I welcome uh, first board members and then public to ask questions on the process and the rationale and to offer questions or concerns for the committee to address in the next two weeks. At our next meeting, uh, the second reading, any changes the committee and the town council recommends will be considered and the board will probably be asked to vote on the policies. Once the select board approves them, appropriate procedures will be developed to support the policies. The resulting combination of the policies with the procedures will then be posted on the Bennington Police Department's website for anybody to see at any time. So again, tonight is the first reading of the following Bennington community policing policies, use of force, duty to intervene, and use of conducted electronic weapons or CEWs. And to take us through this, I think I might turn this meeting over to you, Bruce, and um, have you uh, describe anything about the process that I missed and field any questions that may come from the board first and then any that we uh, get from the public. Sure. Well, let me just uh, add to what Don has already said. Um, we didn't write these from scratch. Um, we actually had at our disposal, and this is true, I think, of each of the policies, at least for the most part, uh, a model policy from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, a model policy from the IACP, also, we had, uh, in many cases, policies from the Bennington Police Department, some of which were taken directly from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, and that's the case in terms of the use of force uh, response to resistance policy that we're looking at tonight and in two weeks. We also had access to the Brattleboro Police Department and the Vermont State Police Department policies, just so folks understand that. And that would be true of all of the members of the committee. Um, <clears throat> it should be noted that we did not, for the most part, look at procedures, although that isn't the case so much under the response to resistance use of, use of force policy. 
Um, since they all, all of these have an attached procedures section, um, we looked at that, but any of our thoughts on th that section have gone to the chief for his consideration um, and we consider them suggestions to him. Uh, I will say uh, just one other um, point um, and that is that uh, the policy that you see before you is essentially the policy that the, that the committee put together with really two, what I would call two major exceptions. Uh, one, um, and, the, and the committee was notified of each of these additions. Um, under definitions, we added the definition under prohibited restraint. And that is because the state legislature passed a law at the end of December, which uh, requires uh, that this kind of uh, addition be used. The, re the use of uh, pressure on the neck, throat, or windpipe, or carotid artery to prevent or hinder breathing, reduce intake of air, or impede the flow of blood or oxygen to the brain is prohibited. And so we wanted to make sure that that was in there, obviously. Uh, and finally, um, one in one section, we, uh, under the definition of duty of care, we added um, the standard that is in actually the policy itself. We added the standard for uh, when an officer would be um, required to um, provide mental health resources uh, or mental health services when such when when something like that is necessary and it's this objective standard which just leads me to my last comment we as the policy drafting committee uh, and we here on the select board are really working um, between a series what i would consider a series of boundaries um, one of the boundaries is police practice. These are things that this is the practice that of law enforcement as it has been taught and as it currently exists. That's one boundary. Another boundary is the community. Um, and that, that's what we hope we will be hearing from now. But also we did when we brought it to the uh, committee itself. The third boundary is, is state law and the legislature. So there are certain things over which, and actually in courts, there are certain things uh, over which we don't have a lot of control. Um, and when we, uh, if you were to look at the uh, use of conductive, conducted electrical weapons, that's a per perfect example. That policy with uh, almost no um, changes on our part, is the statute and the legislature passed a statute about the use of those kinds of conducted electro electrical weapons. And that's why the policy, we, the legislature basically said, you will pass a policy and it will look like this. So that's why that is as it is. Uh, with that, I'm happy to take any questions from the board. And before we go there, let me just remind the board that uh, what will work best is, is not to uh, wordsmith tonight, but is to ask questions about the process, to ask questions about the rationale for some of the decisions that the committee made. And if there are concerns or questions that you'd like addressed to give them to the, uh, the committee members and they will take them back to the full committee, including the citizen component of that committee and the legal review of town council and the review of the police department and make sure that whatever comes to us next week incorporates changes that are actionable. Okay, so we have a couple hands up. We're gonna go in this order. We're gonna go Jeannie, Jim, Jean. Go ahead, Jeannie. Okay, um, so thank you. Um, I did have the pleasure of sitting uh, and listening to this policy discussion and it was incredibly thoughtful. Um, I, um, there was a lot of discussion about the purpose, um, and adding the word perceived, uh, to resistance 
so that the purpose of this policy is to direct officers in the appropriate responses to perceived resistance or use of force, which I think was really important. And that was, it was a really excellent discussion. Um, because of that, I, I have a couple questions. One, I'm wondering just under related uh, policies, if it makes sense to include individuals experiencing a mental health concern uh, just because of the conversation we had about, or you guys had about what perceived, why one might perceive uh, resistance when in fact it might not really be persistent uh, resistance. And then under the policy section, I'm wondering if it makes sense to include a sentence acknowledging the role of de-escalation um, uh, maybe after um, officers will use only reasonable force to bring an incident or event under control, uh, just adding something that speaks to the role of de-escalation in that. And then I don't know what I think about this really, but I just wanted to throw it out. Also, whether it makes sense to use the language from the CEW policy that um, says that special consideration or consideration should be made of special populations and special circumstances, uh, just in, in how we think about force. So those were, those were really my, those were my major comments. My other comment on this policy was under the definition of active resistance, which is O under definitions. There is a, a much more detailed definition of active resistance under the CEW policy that talks about what is and isn't active resistance. So for instance, it says things like, um, uh, it talks about civil disobedience uh, and, and sort of that is an active resistance. And we might want to use, we might want to just copy that language and put it in O. So that's, I, I'll, I'll stop there. I think I have some, I have some comments on the second policy as well, but I think I'll just stop there. And Amy, those it. are good points. Uh, and, and Bruce, it might be good for you to talk about the role of definitions at some point here. I think she did surface one sure. that didn't match. Uh, so. Right. I, actually, I could do that now. I, those are all great um, suggestions, probably. Um, um, many of them could be just incorporated. I don't see a problem with that. But um, uh, yes, for, for those who um, are wondering why there are all these definitions and there isn't that kind of terminology in the policy, um, many of these um, definitions refer down what, to, to what will be the procedure. Um, the procedure is actually laid out in the League of Cities and Towns, and that's the procedure that the Bennington Police Department has been using, and those items ought to be defined, and, the, and definitions end up acting as a kind of extension of the policy. So they, the policy committees have looked at purpose, policy, and definitions for those very reasons. Um, I do like the, the notion uh, of um, including the CEW definition um, of active resistance that makes a lot of sense. And because in essence, our definitions really ought to be pretty closely aligned, if not identical, and that's a better definition. So for what it's worth. It's also, it's also true that the de-escalation that you mentioned, Jeannie, you know, there is a there is yeah. the, the I, de-escalation, and, and then in there it states, when feasible officers will use de-escalation and other techniques to reduce the immediacy of threats to people's safety and stabilize incidents. So that's what you're getting at, but you're looking for that in the policy, not just in the definitions. Yeah, and that makes some actual sense in as much as that's also in the procedures. Um, so I, I don't have, I certainly don't have any objection to that. And my, and my guess is the committee won't, but I, we will share these after I revise the draft so far, we haven't talked about anything that I think Rob would have a problem with, the town attorney. So there we go. Thanks. Thank you, Jeannie. Good, good points. Um, G Jim Carroll, you're next, please. Uh, thank you, Don. Um, I just want to point out to the uh, listening and general public that uh, these policies are under the, uh, they're not being dictated 
to us by the members of uh, these committees. The, these are the recommendations that are made and they are subject to the acceptance by the select board in each and every case. I just wanna make that clarification. That's it. Yep, that's a good that's good clarification, Jim. It is um, a group process that has gotten us here, but it's one that has been bookended by um, legal and practical review. So um, it's now it's now come to us kind of in in a state that could be approved uh, if we if we so choose, or could be amended. So thank you for bringing that up, uh, Jean Connor. Yeah, I just had a really quick um, clarification, Bruce. You mentioned the date when the legislature um, took action on this policy, and you said the end of December. Was that last December, or they're going to take action this next December, this coming no, December? No, it was actually at the tail end of their session, whenever that was. And I did I say... I, I lose track of where we are in the day, in the year. Yeah, I just wanted the minutes to reflect. I, I, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, Jim, when did the legislature end? Do you recall? It was probably October. It was, but uh, there is still uh, a lingering sensation that we may be called in uh, right. before the, uh, the end of my term in January. You right. never know. I understand. So, so Gene, for the for, thank you for that correction. Uh, it was a miss misspeak on my part. It, it should have said in October. Okay. And I have a question, but it's on one of the other policies. I'll wait till later. Oh, you can go, go ahead. The three, go ahead, Gene. We've oh, got okay. all three. Yeah. Okay. So this is um, the use of electronic weapons. Page two and. Three. Conducted electrical weapons. Yeah. Yeah, conducted electrical weapons. That's the terminology. Wait a minute. Maybe I'm wrong. Which one is this? No, I'm sorry. Duty to intervene. Ah, thank no, you. No, no, no. No, no, no. I was right the first time. Use of okay. conducted electrical weapons. Yep. Okay. So on page two of this policy, there's two references to age. Under 18 years of age, which is... Um, under section B. Correct. Letter D and letter F is over 65 years of age. Correct. How, that just seems a little bit subjective. So it's just based on kind of like what a normal 18 year old probably would look like or what you would expect a 65 year old to look like. It, 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 I don't know, that would make me nervous if I had to be able to put an age on someone. Perfectly understandable, and that's probably what every law enforcement officer thinks as well. Just for everybody's and your sake, so that you understand, this is language we cannot change. Okay. This is all statutory. This is, this is a policy that is essentially put into, stat, that, that was previously already put into statute at 20 BSA 2367A1. Okay. That's where this all comes from. Do officers have to make a judgment? Um, the idea is they should not be using CEWs on, on persons who, are, who appear to be under 18 or over 65. Okay. Um, that means that, you know, does an officer look at me and say, gee, you look to be over 65? And I'll say, thank you. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a judgment call. Uh, but it is an attempt, an attempt to try to to narrow the scope of when these things, uh, when they can be utilized. Yeah, it's certainly better than nothing. That's for sure. Yeah, and and I suppose we could be um, clearer. I'm apologizing for the phone in the background. I can't turn it off. Um, the we could we might be able to narrow it more, but I'm not sure that helps us at all. Okay. And then I have a similar question on page three of the same policy, letter K, positional asphyxia. Yes. Um, the last sentence, the BPD prohibits prolonged face down prone restraint. Is that another situation that you, we can't change it? I, this, I had the same pr problem with the word prolonged. What I would consider prolonged and what someone else might consider prolonged could be very different. 
Right. It is a subjective word. Okay. But it has to be there. So just, to, um, just to nuance what you said, Bruce, you used the word all, but you just meant the CEW policy, right? So under the CEW policy, the, the CEW, the use of CEWs is really restrict and is restricted by the state legislature. So just this third one, Gene, is really, is really something that yep, they can't and, change very much. And I think the language that we put in this agency or the BPW, the Bennington Police Department, prohibits prolonged face down prone uh, restraint, uh, prolonged face down prone restraint is our language. And that was language that the Bennington PD had put in in its original uh, use of conducted electrical weapons. It's not in the statute, uh, but we do. Um, it's prohibited and prolonged is, you know, if it, if in the view of a reasonable objective officer, it is causing uh, respiratory distress, it's already prolonged. And that's why we have- Bruce, what page and, and uh, policy was that? That's under the use of- Bruce, which page and policy was okay, that? I'm gonna, yeah. The, the policy is the use of conducted electrical weapons. I believe it's on page three. Uh, it's the last it. of the definitions on positional asphyxia. Yep. I got it. Thanks. Good. So I don't know. I mean, you can't prevent all face down prone restraint because at some point you need to restrain someone for even five, you know, 10 seconds in order to place them in cuffs, for example, in restraints. So that's a prone face down restraint, but it's certainly not prolonged. I, Either way, it's not something that we're, we're, we are allowed to change because it's- it, Well, this, point, this right? language I think is more ours than the statute, but so we could actually, if you think it, you could come up with a different word than prolonged, that I think we could I see. modify. But the general idea that uh, uh, avoiding pr positional asphyxia is really the statutory requirement. Maybe instead of prolonged, you could say as short an amount of time as possible, or you know, switch it around as necessary. Or I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I just it, it makes well, me uncomfortable. It, it smacks of wordsmithing. Why don't yeah, we we're, we're, we'll it, we'll take a look at that section and see what we come up with. Well, I wouldn't call it wordsmithing. I mean, I, I understand your concern and I think we can take it and, and look at it. Yeah, wordsmithing to me is grammatical stuff. We're still Gene, I'm there. sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to cut you off. And I, no, I also, we're just, also think I it's a really good point. I didn't realize there was flexibility there. I, I think it's, it's great that you brought it up. Thank you. And, you know, you know Bruce, if your gang can chew on that oh, yeah. sense of, that, of her point, that'd be great. Yep, we can think of something. So I have a couple more hands up. I see Jeannie and then Jim. Go ahead, Jeannie. Hi, so um, I'm not gonna do any wordsmithing on, on um, duty to intervene, but I think you probably saw there are a couple, there, there are a couple places where they're missing words. But my, uh -huh. my question is under policy B1, yes. under the duty to intervene, one of the reasons to intervene is to prevent the use of unreasonable force. And it feels to me like it would be useful to have a definition. Um, I looked through the CEW policy has a definition of reasonable force, but not one of unreasonable use of force. But it, it, feels, it feels like either we need to define what, what um, use of force means or unreasonable use of force just to help us out here. So that would be my. Okay. So let me just, just for everybody's sake. Okay. And, and Rob can um, prepare me for some other, um, what, what you've opened up to basically the standard for use of force is what a reasonable officer would per, uh, perceive uh, in the same circumstances. So it That's, might, 
Yeah, right. And I mean, sort of I mean we like, could say that more explicitly in that section, um, yeah. but we can't say anything other than that. Okay. In so other words, I'm, we're, that's precisely the area that the courts have said uh, that unless, unless a state legislature wants to go in a very different direction, that's the direction we have to be. That's the standard for understanding what reasonable, what okay. force is allowable. It's okay. reasonable. So okay. if the, isn't the excessive force uh, R in the first policy, isn't that what you're getting at? Yeah. Yeah. So if we can do something, I mean, the I get that the policies are linked, but they're also standalone. So it, it feels to me like there should be the fact that we're talking about use of force a, as a as a reason to intervene means that in some way we'd want to define either what reasonable use of force or unreasonable. And, and I get that unreasonable use of force would be much harder to define. So anyway, it, it's just a suggestion. Maybe, gotcha. maybe add we'll see what we can do. Yeah. Although I do think this excessive force is is that definition that you're somewhat looking for, isn't mm -hmm. it? Um, uh, although it, yeah, the intent, it circles around what's reasonable. Uh, I get that. Right. The intent of the, uh, let, me, let me say something about the, the reason we could have, and many um, jurisdictions do include the duty to intervene right into, right in the use of force policy. Um, and, and there's, you know, good reasons to do that. And that's how I was approaching it. Um, after conversation with the League of Cities and Towns uh, and with a few others, uh, particularly in the law enforcement community, um, the reason to put it separately is to make sure that it is clear to uh, officers who are um, lower in the hierarchy that they're... Um, that, that they have a duty to intervene that, that goes above and beyond the hierarchy. That is to say, if they perceive that, uh, this is a hypothetical, if they perceive that a superior officer is in fact using unreasonable force under the use of force policy, then they have a duty to intervene and stop it if they can do that so safely and they have an absolute duty to report it once it's done. Yeah, so, no, no concerns about that. I just think I understand that, but that's why it's separate. So, um, but I'm happy to strengthen. See if we can strengthen that that particular section under. Um, it's the duty to intervene. Um, I'm just making sure I've got your section correct. It's yeah. the duty. It's under the policy B one, correct? Um, yeah, so either t it would go under B1 or it could go under definitions and be a B under definitions, whichever. Yep. And, or whatever. it could be both. Right. Okay. Okay, thank Helpful. you. So Bruce, you did, you did say to me at one point that not all definitions need to be in each policy because one definition stands in for another place. So, right. so the use of force, as, as it's used by the police department, um, the, me, as it's used by the police department, the uh, unreasonable force as it's defined in the use of force policy would also be unreasonable use of force in the duty intervene policy. An officer can't say, well, I'm, I, you know, I was thinking of the other policy and it didn't have a definition. No, they, um, officers are required obligated to follow all the policies and know them. Um, that may seem too much, but that's what we're requiring of them. So this excessive force definition carries through all of the other policies. Yep. Okay. A uh, couple of other hands up here and one person in the waiting room. So I'm gonna call on Jim and then Sarah, and then we're gonna to go to uh, caller ending in 840 after that. Go ahead, Jim. Thank you. Um, under uh, use of conductive uh, electrical, electrical weapons, the last codicil or uh, letter K, um, there's, and I know we aren't supposed to do any wordsmithing here and I'm not trying to, but um, the, the problem that I have with the phrase, uh, a subject, uh, officers restraining a subject should be 
cognizant of and re, and avoid positional asphyxia. Um, is there, I guess this is a question for Stu, is there any training in, uh, for Bennington police officers with respect to physiological responses for those that are being uh, restrained? Yes, there's an annual training for, for use of force, I believe, uh, that all officers must, must take. I think in COVID, it's been uh, virtual, but normally it's hands-on. Okay, can you elaborate in any way? And your, your mic really is terrible. I, I do apologize for that. It's a new, a new microphone to uh, allow my PC to be used in this manner. Uh, so I'm going to have to probably go back to using a laptop to, to, to clear this up. But nonetheless, no, I don't, I don't have experience with that, Jim. So I'm not the okay. guy to, to, to elaborate. All right. Um, for the board, you know, or um, those that are writing this, I, I would hope there, there could be a little bit more clarification on that rather than just the word cognizant. I mean, we, we all know that stepping on somebody's face is probably gonna hurt them, um, but it, it ought to be clearer as a policy. I don't much care for the word cognizant myself anyway, but uh, good points, Jim. Um, so if that covers your points, I'd, I'd ask Sarah, go ahead, and then we'll take a caller from uh, the waiting room. Yeah, so this one's quick. Um, I think everything, good, good points. I think, you know, just looking that over with those points. I just had a question about the Kelia standard under response resistance use of force page. Is that to be carried over through all of the other um, duty to intervene and use the CEWs as well? Or are there other standards that can be applied to those through Kelia? Yeah. Sarah, I didn't quite catch where. So can you just repeat that one more time? Sure. So um, the first response to resistance page, there's the Kalia standard, and there's a bunch of different things listed there. There's a what standard? Kalia standard. There's the um, Vermont statute section standard section. Oh, that Kalia standard. Yes. I, yep. I see where you're going. Okay. In the heading. Yep, in the heading. Um, quite frankly, I am not at all clear about what those Kalia standards do. That's something that was on the League of Cities and Towns and I hadn't deleted it necessarily. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm gonna ask the chief, how helpful are they? If they're very helpful, then we'll keep them because th these policies are really designed for him. You can go into C-A-L-E-A, that's a, you know, an acronym. You can go into that and see where they are. You can go online and, and get there. Right. Yeah. I just wondered if that would, yeah. So you're not really sure. And I, yeah, if, um, if possible, I think it would be, um, great for us to find some more Kilia standards to, to meet. I, that's I'm the commission on accreditation for law enforcement agencies, which is what that stands for. Yep. Um, currently as I see it doesn't have, or at least I wasn't able to find anything on conductive conducted electrical weapons, but that doesn't mean that they haven't been developing them and they haven't been posting them on the website. It's dependent upon them, but we can certainly find out. Okay, and do you know about duty to intervene? Do they have anything on that? I do not, uh, if, it's, if it's not there, that means I haven't found it. Okay, thanks. But I'm also going through Trevor up at, up at the League of Cities and Towns um, who, who is much more up on those, uh, on that connection. But if you'd like me to make sure that they're there, I, and I, I had been thinking once we pass this, we'll talk to the chief and see if that's what he wants there. Because he doesn't have them on, and the chief, the current Bennington policies doesn't have any of those. But I, I like the idea that there are these standards that are, are universally um, accepted professional standards. It makes a lot of sense to me. I, I agree with that. I think Kalia is something we should try to try to meet. Okay. Not a problem. Is that it, Sarah? That's it. I just, I like the Kalia in there and I thought, hey, let's move, move with us. Thanks. Okay. 
so if uh, I don't know if the board is at, a, at uh, fully exhausted your questions, but there's somebody that was in the waiting room. They fell out of the waiting room. They're back in the waiting room. I'd like to let uh, Sam in and uh, see what he has to say tonight. So caller ending at 840, you are in the Bennington Select Board meeting and uh, welcome. Uh, welcome back. And uh, yeah, press star six and let us know your name and what's on your mind. Uh, good evening, uh, uh, Chairman Campbell. This is Sam Rastuno. How are you doing? Good evening, Sam. I'm doing well, thanks. Thanks for joining okay. us. Okay. Uh, thank you for allowing me to comment. Um, believe it or not, on policy of, I know there's a lot to go through in the language, and this is just the first draft, and I hope um, residents have a time to comment on this. Uh, I don't know how you're going to handle this before you adopt it, but let me say uh, I have experienced being... Um, how could I say it? In the system with Bangkok Police Department, especially on the borderline of, I won't quite say mental health, but when officers do respond, I strongly urge that they try to de-escalate a situation because believe it or not, and I'll put it on record, I was handcuffed because an officer possibly felt threat threatened. I didn't see that threat, but I was handcuffed by an officer and yes, put in the back of a patrol car and processed. It was a domestic between aging in place and my mom and these new officers that come aboard, they better get on the stick and know people's situations when there's a domestic. So I strongly urge before a situation handles like that, they strongly have to talk things out. And I know the officers are busy on other calls as well, but, um, quite a few calls, as you know, when they do respond, it's an open book that it's a domestic out there and it's gonna get worse. Sam, thank you for bringing that um, personal and real life experience. We, we appreciate that, it's very bold of you. And um, I, I do think that's the intent, Bruce, of, of what your gang's been getting at, right? Uh, yes, that would be true. Uh, we're actually, um, Sam, I do appreciate it. Um, that may very well, uh, give us another reason to include de-escalation in the actual uh, paragraph of the policy. I think that's not a bad idea. It's it's extensively used in the procedures section, by the way, you should know. Um, um, and hopefully you'll see that up. Uh, just on- I, mean, I can understand. Uh, yep, Sam. I can, I can, I can, uh, you I can understand been, when, Yep, go ahead. I can understand where an officer gives direction and they say at once, and they say it twice, and they don't honor the the ones that they ask, don't honor that um, instruction, then they ha officers naturally have no recourse to say, put your arms behind your back, I'm going to cuff you. Because it's a very fine line on every situation that's out there that's different. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, and, and officers out there are put in all kinds of situations from hot to cold, I mean, um, and I commend them. It's not an easy task out there, same with, with anyone that's first responding out there. Um, you know, they, they offer for backup. It's great when they do have a uh, backup, but sometimes that backup is not gonna be uh, available. And um, it's dangerous out there, I understand their situation, but it's just, I think in my impersonal situation, they could have handled it differently because of uh, Bruce, I know you probably know my situation too. I've been through the program of um, mm -hmm. R R RSJ or whatever you're putting out, res restore of yeah. justice. Restorative so justice. I, so I, can, I can speak about it. So, um, right. you know, thank you for allowing me to, to speak openly about this. It's somewhat difficult, but I think it needs to be said. Sam, before you ring off, um, Jim, I see you have your hand up. Do you have a question of clarification for Sam or is your... your uh, Point on for both, well, it's for both um, Sam and Bruce with respect to this policy and the development of this policy. I think it's absurd to expect that uh, uh, the police department or a police a member of the police force would know an individual's um, uh, history or or um, or you know criminal activity. I mean, that's just absurd. Um, Police officers have to show up to a place uh, where a complaint has been made, not knowing all of the facts, 
um, just responding to a, a complaint and to try to codify that in uh, these policies is just absurd. Well, no, that what we're going for in these policies is, is a uniform approach, right? Of, of de-escalation and of nonviolence. And- right. Yes, but yes, but my point is, you know, can a police officer, you know, know with the, the number of that we have in uh, our police department, are they going to know each and every one of the individuals that they're encountering? I mean, of that's course just not. Jim. Of course, they're not going to know every everything. On the other hand, I will say <laughs> no. But I no, let, Sam. Let me respond first. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, you got it. I, I, on the other hand, you know, law enforcement. I have <clears throat> incredible respect for them. Be, partly because, you know, they do have um, recurrent experiences with some of, you know, with, with folks. Uh, Some of my clients were, were repeats uh, and the officers who responded, responded uh, again. And, and in those situations, you know, the officers the second time through uh, treated the situation very differently than they did the first time through. So it's, you're right. It's a learning that, process. That's, uh, Bruce, we all agree Bruce, with that. Bruce, that's all well and good, but you know there are going to be new police officers in each one of, of those course. situational um, encounters who aren't going to know who these people are and what their history is. So, right. and anyway. they are entitled to. Uh, I'll just, this is what I was going to say to Sam. Officers are entitled to uh, if they believe that they may be in da- may be in danger. They are entitled to. Uh, place uh, the person I have been placed in restraints, um, not because I was acting belligerently and not because I was acting anything at all, um, but I was placed in restraints and placed in the back of a truck um, uh, and, you know, had done nothing wrong. Um, that all gets straightened out eventually. Uh, it is traumatic. It's traumatic for the person who's in restraints and, we have to recognize that. And the, I think the policy will be for everybody. And this is not just for Jim or for Sam or any of the rest. Here's the, here's the reason for the policy. The policy actually seeks to guide police officers, law enforcement officers in the use of their absolutely necessary discretion. They have to have discretion to do certain things, but within certain boundaries. What we're trying to do is set out what policy does uh, and what the general orders did um, that the police have been working under is set where those boundaries are. We're now making those boundaries public and that's the positive of this process. So Sam, thank you very much for uh, your comments and thank you for uh, this but I'm going to ask one more. Bruce was correct by if once new officers come aboard and they're aware of the situation, it's up yeah. to dispatch to let them know that when they respond to a certain address with today's technology and the computer, they can quickly pull up a case history of the said complaint. I know who it is. Just for a fact that when I had issues with my father who had moderate Alzheimer's situation, I personally let dispatch know that when a response is in, called in or a complaint, please be it known that the issue that's going to be involved is an issue with a, a disargument with my father because he has Alzheimer's. Okay. There's a key point where, where Bruce spoke up to the situation. Naturally, when new officers on board, they haven't known the beat yet, but they're going to know quick of certain instances when they do respond. And yes, when we get in situations of borderline mental health and um, uh, domestics that they're going to start learning the vibe of Bennington. It's just that the point being was, I didn't think I was threatening an officer, but to hear that statement that uh, put your arms behind your back, naturally, if you refuse that statement, then that escalates the situation anymore that an officer made a statement to put your arms behind your back. You refuse them and give probable cause to be handcuffed. And it was quite embarrassing to be put in behind a, a patrol and even process. And I told them I had, I've been in the system before. I've been through um, um, the system and naturally they had to just go with policy by being fingerprinted and uh, photographed. So um, only because, sorry, I'm Italian. I get a little loud and my neighbors should be knowing going on what's going on when I, I have 
issues with persons uh, aging in place. So being with that, happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Thank you for allowing me to speak, and I will back out. Thank you, Sam. Have a good evening and a good Thanksgiving yourself. Yep. Thank you for my suggestion. Bye-bye. Uh, Jeannie, I see you have your hand up. Uh, th there's some, a couple people in the waiting room or one person in the waiting room at this point. So, um, are you, uh, would you like me to go to her or? Yeah, that's okay. I was just going to follow up. I, um, I just, uh, want to make sure we address Sam's question about next steps, um, uh, and how the public does comment if they don't comment tonight and sort of deadlines. So beyond that, um, go, please go to the public. Uh, Bruce, why don't, we, why don't you make that kind of the wrap up when we uh, get ready to end this item? Sure. So people can do that. You know, one thing I haven't done, although there are a couple of callers, I haven't put up on the screen uh, recently the call-in information, gotten a little bit involved in this conversation. But if you do want to uh, participate, the dial-in number is 646-558-8656. Meeting ID is 833-0743. 9977. Press pound a couple of times when prompted. And then once we've entered you into the meeting, you'll have to press star six to unmute yourself. So I'm going to enter caller ending in 037 into the meeting. So caller ending in 037, I've entered you into the meeting. Welcome to the bank and select board meeting. Please press star six and that will unmute you and uh, Hopefully you'll be able to join us. Hi, this is Lynn Mazza, I'm a Bennington resident. Um, you, I've got a question and a comment. So my, quest my question is, um, how can just the regular citizenry of, Benning of Bennington um, access these policies that you guys are looking at? And if they have, if they want to offer feedback, how would they do that? And how would that feedback be incorporated into like the next draft of the policy that you're going to vote on. So I guess that's a three part question. Yeah, that's great, Lynn. And that, that honestly, I mean, maybe we're beginning to wrap up this, um, this conversation, but that is what Bruce, I'd, I'd love you to sure. sure to touch on before the end of this segment, but if you'd like to take it now, that'd be great. Uh, yeah. I have some follow-up questions for you. Sure. The, the policies are, uh, they were in the packet for tonight. Uh, so that's, that's up on this on the on the select board section of the town website. Um, we could make them, I'm assuming, available under the policing uh, community policing um, section of the website. Is that correct, Stuart? I think I I hate to make more work for someone, but if they can put in put up actually, I would I would like all six, both the clean versions and the marked up versions. The clean versions just help people to read it uh, as it currently exists and the marked up versions can show what we've done. Um, so Lynn, that would be one of the ways. Uh, that's how you can get at them. Uh, and feedback can certainly come to Jeannie, Jean, or me via, probably me, let me, let me just stick my, my uh, neck out there. Use my uh, select board um, email address, which is Clark at, uh, oh, I can never remember. Um, at what? Um, Bennington, it's at BenningtonVT.org. Yes, thank you. Clark at BenningtonVT.org. There's no hyphen. Bruce, go on to the select board section of the website, go down to the members and there's, there's our emails right there and click on that. So Bruce, um, when, because you want to take this back to the committee, uh, we probably should set a deadline for when. I was just looking at the calendar. Okay. Um, I'm going to suggest that since I want to have things out to the original drafting committee by November 30th, um, that would be a week from tonight, that people would have that week um, to, to be in back in touch with me. 
uh, or and and I'll see what I can do. Jeannie, you have. I'm just wondering if uh, we don't meet again until December 14th. Oh, that's so true. Could we have a little? Could we? You could have even day? more time. Yeah. How about December 7th? D Day. So, uh, so, so what? I will write it down. Uh, feedback by December 7th. I forgot this was one of those three week um, interregnums. And uh, partly because I have another policy that is being um, worked on at de on December 2nd. So um, I can only think of so many things at once in my head. So yes, so does that help uh, Lynn? Yeah, that's that's very very helpful. I'm I'm really glad to see you guys are releasing the marked up copy as well because that helps to understand the thinking that went into developing. I, I think so exactly. So we'll we will make sure that the marked up copy as well as a cleanish copy is there, um, which helps reading uh, purposes. Um, the marked up person. You should also know that the model policies are there already on the website. So the model that we used in each of these cases was from the League of Cities and Towns. And that's up on the town website under the community policing. Okay, great, thanks. And so then if I'm understanding right, um, if somebody reads it and has comments or feedback or whatever, they should get it to you at your yeah. email by December 7th. And then how will that be kind of incorporated into the policy going forward? Or how will that feedback be? Well, what's, go what's gonna happen, Lynn, is that I'm gonna try to incorporate uh, what I can. I'll, I will leave, the, the, the board will see all of the responses. I think that's the, most, the best way to do it. Um, I will uh, make what changes I think can be made. Um, and I know that sounds very subjective for me but nonetheless, uh, somebody has to write something up so that we can send it out to the members of the committee for their reaction, um, I would say within that week so that we can get it back. Um, if we're talking the seventh, uh, I have to have it in to the office by the 10th uh, the morning of the 10th so that they can put it out in the packet. So that's, I think that's correct. Okay. Yep. So, so the, the committee is going to, I'm, I may be making a draft even over the weekend uh, before the seventh and just send it out early morning on the seventh and say, you got 48 hours. Tell me what you think. They're pretty good about that. They're good. These are, as you know, Lynn, you were there. Um, these are folks who know how to speak their mind. Right. Yeah. And, and that kind of gets me to my comment, because as you say, I was there and, and I really felt like the folks there were really kind of asking the right questions and running it, running this through the right filters. So um, that being said, I need to point out publicly um, that no matter how well these policies are written, um, we, we're not going to create that cultural shift that the IACP recommended without a top-down leadership change. Um, so, and then also, without oversight, we'll have no way of knowing um, how these policy changes are actually being implemented, how these policies actually look on the ground. So ultimately, we're going to need an independent citizen's oversight committee to make sure that these policies are actually being followed in the spirit that they were written. And so I just, I just wanted to put that out there publicly again. I think it's so important that that independent citizens group is on the table, that we're talking about it, we're thinking about it, we're planning for it, because it is so essential to this whole process if we're actually right going to create any real yep. change. That's my and, two cents. And Lynn, uh, Right, I, I get your two cents. Um, let me just, and then I'll let everybody else speak. Um, I'm, I would agree with you that, that uh, culture change takes a lot. I would also agree, I, I, I would just guard everybody into, the, the policy piece is a piece of a process. And it is not 
all of the process. It is my sense that, that we are working toward um, something more than just in enacting policies. Um, but I have already begun to, to hear and see change, um, at least in my conversations, for which I am very grateful and very thankful. So um, on that note, I would agree with you that policies in and of themselves don't, are not the whole kit and caboodle. Thanks. Excellent, thanks. And I wanna wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving as well. Thank you, you too. Have a good night, you guys, bye. Good night. So board members, uh, we're at a point where we've had some substantial conversation here. Uh, I think we have some next steps. We have, uh, you've clearly laid out, Bruce, how people can participate if they haven't already and if they want to. So I think that's a good step. Uh, it probably goes without saying that if, if you find you've got more change to make, then we could simply consider and, and vote on at our next meeting, we will take longer to, to do what we have to do. So this is a, the, the premium is not as much on speed here as it, although it would be nice to get this done, it'd be nice to get this in place and have these practices codified. The premium is on uh, good work, not on fast work. So thank you for continuing to do good work. Uh, before we, Segway, I think maybe Jean has one more comment. Yeah, just really quickly. Um, I didn't want Lynn and maybe others to assume that any suggestion or comment that they would like to add will automatically be part of the policy, um, as That's was right. the case with some of our concerns and questions. You know, they're statutory. We don't have a lot of flexibility sometimes. So I, I just didn't want her to leave the conversation thinking that, you know, everything that they ask for is going to necessarily be incorporated. True. Very good point. It's true for everybody. I think probably Lynn is a little more plugged in than, than others because she has been at some of these things. So she probably realizes the give and take that has to happen between what's legal and what's practical and, and what's, what's desirable. But that's a great point to make, Gene, and everybody should bear that in mind. This is, uh, it's not a kitchen sink document. It's a, it's a, it's a, the document that we've asked a specific group of, of citizens and professionals to work out so that we can have a, a really high quality piece of work when we're done. So I'd like to thank, uh, thank you three for working on that. The next, um, Bruce, any last words from you before I, uh, jump to the next agenda item, which is actually community policing update. No, I've said enough. Okay. Well, thank you for, thank you for saying what you have said. I think it was extremely helpful tonight. Um, Jeannie, gentle segue to community policing update. Um, is there anything that you would like to um, bring forward at this point? Um, I don't think I have anything. I think we've laid out the timeline uh, through next June, maybe. Um, but I uh, want to turn it over to Jean and Bruce just to talk about the discussion boards and also the final policy that we'll be looking at. So Great. Jean. Let me go first. Okay. And I just want to take a moment to thank Bruce. This is, you've handled this process, which is lots of moving parts phenomenally. It's just, it's been amazing to watch you just kind of do all of this keep all the balls in the air at the same time. So my hat, my hat is off to you. Um, yeah, I don't have a lot to add about the community policing boards. They're up for, geez, four more days. They're gonna come down on Friday. This is the fourth and final question that's posted right now. I just did a tally. Um, we have 95 comments um, on, from all the questions, not just the final question. So I'm quite confident we'll, we'll definitely get to hundred by the end of the week. And the current question, just to refresh folks' memories, is how can the community and the Bennington Police Department better engage with each other? And the boards are at um, GBIX on Depot Street, St. Peter's Church, the Rec Center, the Town Office, and Powers Market in North Bennington. So if you have anything to say about that last question, you have until Friday to uh, 
to put your comments up. That's all I've got. Jim, uh, I see you have your hand up. Did you have a question for Jean? Not a question for Jean, uh, just a comment to sort of echo what uh, Jean Connor just said. Um, and I've said this in private uh, amongst our, ourselves that this, you know, the work that we've done with the, these policies is probably some of the most important work that we'll ever do for the town of Bennington. And uh, that cannot be underscored enough. And I want to thank all those that were involved, Bruce particularly, and uh, the rest of uh, those people that were in, uh, involved in the development of this policy, that this is really important work, and that should be noted. That's all. If I can just cut in, you know, Bruce, you have done a great job on this, but, but Jeannie and Jean, you also have put a tremendous amount of work in this. Curtis Reed described it as laying bricks. Uh, and making sure you have a good foundation and, and building from the bottom up. And so the work you did earlier this summer with the research groups and uh, that sort of underlying information and, and building a process for all this and working on figuring out ways to involve the community, all of that's extremely valuable. I'm, I'm grateful to the three of you uh, for everything you've done. Oh, sorry sorry to have interrupted your flow though, uh, Bruce and Jean, uh, go ahead. One, uh, just we have one more policy to look at, uh, and that's coming up uh, a week from Wednesday, uh, and that is the investigation of domestic violence um, incidents, and a policy on that. Uh, we will. Um, I just want to say th uh, thank you to all of the community members who have participated, as well as the two Dans, Dan Monks and Dan Ferraro, um, and. The occasional conversations I've had with the chief and lieutenant, they've all been positive, helpful, constructive, uh, and the talent that has come forth uh, voluntarily from the community has been really quite remarkable. And uh, uh, I, you know, the work is, you know, um, my, my contribution is really just to try to facilitate the conversation these folks really know what they're talking about and I've been I've been exceptionally impressed by the folks of Bennington and and by the comments tonight so thank you all we can only make it better uh, it's policy is one of those things that's a work in progress all the time um, and um, you know if there's another body that ends up taking over the work of developing policy that will be fine and dandy but for now this is where we are thank you All right. Well, um, that concludes the community policing update, I think. Right, Jeannie? Yep. Okay. So uh, let's move on to the manager's report. Stuart, we have a couple of action items tonight. Would you like to walk us through um, the ladder truck and the uh, DPW? Sure thing. Uh, the, the first action item is a uh, what's called a hearing notice validation. Uh, in preparation for bonding for the ladder truck. Uh, bond counsel Paul Giuliani uh, felt that uh, the warnings that we used uh, were not adequate or not up to the standard he believed adequate. I did a attach a copy of what we used, which laid out the, the, the public hearing notice as well as the um, article to be voted on uh, it's a process that we have used for some 27 years uh, without question, but uh, this time he questioned it. Uh, and uh, so the statute does provide that if there is a mistake or the warnings weren't clear, there is an opportunity for the board to validate the warnings and therefore the vote. And we had a very positive vote, as you know. I think it was two or three to one. Uh, so we do need the board to adopt the resolution that is attached. When you do so, uh, it will then be submitted to the town clerk for certification. That goes in with the bond package application, and we would be uh, therefore eligible for the monies to pay for the ladder truck, which is due here in February. Thank you. It, it looks to me like uh, a beautiful 
public hearing notice. And I'm surprised that they didn't think there was enough uh, exposure there, but it, it, it looks, uh, I would have thought it was perfect too, but why don't we correct this? If I could have a motion uh, to for the chair to sign the validation resolution, I'd appreciate that. So move. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, thank you, Sheriff. I think it's not the chair who gets to sign this one. Oh, uh, you're right. It's no. the town clerk. Town clerk gets this one, Donald. Yep. Ah. <laughs> one less signature. That's great for me. So listen, uh, is there any conversation, any uh, discussion about the validation resolution? Has everybody read it? Does everybody feel okay with it? This is the only comment is the spelling of select board, which I don't think matters enough to retype it. Unfortunately, that is the spelling that, that is statutory. Our charter, oh. our charter is different and it has been <laughs> accepted by the, by the legislature, but select board has now been combined into one word statutorily. Yeah, someday we'll teach the rest of Vermont how to spell it properly. <laughs> all right, not seeing any other questions, I would ask you all to unmute yourself, please. All in favor of the validation resolution, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Okay, Stuart, all set. Thank you. What's your second uh, action second request? Is the uh, ratification of the union ex contract extension. Uh, as I noted uh, in, in the last meeting uh, during our discussions in executive session, the union is asked just to extend the working agreement one more year, uh, principally due to the fact that it's hard to negotiate face-to-face -face during this pandemic. Uh, we basically agreed to extend the contract to one year, uh, they have agreed to an, an increase in the percentage of participation in the healthcare uh, expense. And uh, we've added some additional funds for uh, hazardous pay re related to confined space entry uh, that a number of our employees must be trained and must be prepared to do. Uh, so I am looking for a motion to ratify the contract, I should note that the DPW folks have already done that. They've already voted to ratify. And to be clear, this is exactly what we talked about in executive session last year. Nothing's changed since then. That's correct, except the addition to the um, participation in healthcare costs. It's been increased and they've agreed to that. Okay. Everybody clear on that? All right, I would look for a motion um, to, uh, Modify a uh, motion to ratify the contract extension. I'll make Thank a motion to you. modify you, that. Appreciate that. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Thank you, Gene. Okay, any any discussion, board discussion on this? Questions for Stuart? I think we got them all out during executive session. All right, I ask you please to all unmute yourselves and all in favor of the contract extension, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, much. Stuart. Make sure they know we appreciate them. Uh, I certainly will pass that on. Uh, I do have a couple of things to to just throw out tonight. Um, not no well, no decisions really need to be made right now. Uh, but I have been approached by one of the agencies who would normally be placed in the ballot if they didn't ask for more money. Uh, looking to ask for more money this year uh, and is concerned about having to petition, get signatures on a petition during this recent surge in, in the pandemic. Um, I talked with the Secretary of State's office. Uh, they don't have any real suggestions on how you might uh, uh, alter the signing of petitions that then can be validated properly. Uh, the only alternative uh, to getting a petition is for the board to simply place the additional funds uh, in, on the ballot without a petition. And I know that you're, you've adopted a policy that does not provide for that. And uh, so I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Uh, these folks are, are looking for some alternative to the standard signature uh, build petitions. Who is the group? Uh, I, I don't know that that's important, Jim, but um, because there may be others that are out there feeling the same way. Uh, 
So it's just a, it's a general question that I, I would just, at this point, if the board is gonna stick with their policy, then I, that would be the policy we, we, we require. Just like if we're going to deviate from our policy, we should do that in open session, uh, you know, on, as a warned subject. If, if what we might be able to do is to accept signatures in another format, or there may be some other thing that we could do in lieu of that. But uh, I'm, I'm jumping ahead. Jean, I see you have a hand up and Sarah, your hand's up too. Go ahead, Jeannie. Jeannie's hands up. Sorry, Jeannie. I, um, yeah, uh, so I'm just wondering um, when, uh, if you can give us just the time frame. when did agencies find out what the their time frames were and then what is the time frame by which the signatures would need to be in? Uh, we sent those uh, documents out at least three weeks ago. I'd have to pull my file to find the exact date. I think actually it's up on the web. It's October 13th, I think, okay. but I don't know. Yeah, but I don't know when it, when would they need to have the signatures in? Uh, the signatures have to be in 47 days before the vote. I, what that date is, I don't have that in front of me. The vote is scheduled for March 2nd. So it's sometime in the middle of January uh, or early January, they'd have to be in. Um, so we have, we have some time to consider and perhaps we should place this on the agenda for the 14th uh, to see if the board's willing. Uh, it'll give me a little more time to try to figure out alternatives. Um, they, I mean, you can do electronic signatures, um, but I'm not sure that those are easily verified by the town clerk. Well, we, did we, um, how similar is this to the process that we just went through to put the question of uh, a mayor on, you know, a charter change on, on the ballot? I mean, that, it, it feels like this is sort of that same time frame, and they did, they were proactive and did that. Is it, I, it's, if you can give some sense of whether this is similar or a very different situation. Well, it's, it's, it's similar. It's, it's the only way you can get, uh, from our policy anyway, it's the only way you can get an increase in your, your budget request uh, as an agency before the people. That you must petition and, and you must receive 5% of the voters, which is what the, the mayoral petition did. So you are correct. We already have one petition that was submitted via the standard way, which is signatures and address, uh, printed name for validation. And those have been validated. So if there is an alternative way to do this, uh, I, I'm not sure at this time what that is. So, Sarah, you have your hand up. Would you, you like to weigh in on this? Um, yeah, so you might've already answered my question um, by saying, that there's one in right now. So there is one petition in from an agency currently. Is that correct? Not from an agency. The petition on the mayoral mayoral form. Oh, okay. Okay. So are there done. any petitions from any agencies in currently? Not not at this time. Okay. Because at, at, remember what we said was if you're not going to ask for an increase, you just need to submit your application. The only agency, and it's really not truly an agency, but I've only received uh, that information from the Bennington County Regional Commission at this point. Everybody else is has much more time, but they should be coming in very soon. Okay. All right. Thanks, Stuart. I think we need some. I think we need some good suggestions on this. You know, you and I talked a little bit about this. It's a bit of a head scratcher. If if we did a general amnesty on signatures, we'd have an avalanche of increased requests, and that would hurt the taxpayers. Um, since almost all these things always get uh, passed. However, these are also essential agencies that do a lot for our community and this is a very difficult time. So I think all of us probably see both sides of this. Um, There's sort of a, a double duty to both protect the taxpayers and, and try to keep the budget down, but also um, keep essential services going at a time when our community needs them the most. So I'm not quite sure how to parse it, but if, I think we should do it in open session. I don't think we should just do it as a manager's, uh, if we're gonna make a decision, especially if it's a policy decision, I don't think we should do it in the manager's um, report, uh, unless we were all in agreement that we should just keep it the way it is. So Gene Connor, go ahead. 
Yeah, how do how do agencies normally get their signatures? Just as I'm trying to think about this, do they normally, you know, they just carry it around in their car and when they run into people, they get them to, that's how it's normally done. Or, and I remember, you know, you would see them at South Street Cafe or you would see them at the bookstore or all of the above. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that I was clear on that when I'm trying to think of creative ideas how to do this. Actually, in the past, what what... There was a change that was allowed, and that was all of the agencies that we were asking to petition, which are the ones that asked for more than $7,500, um, they were all allowed to sign the same petition as long as the petitions clearly signified what they were requesting as an agency. So that allowed the agencies to uh, actually split up the number of pages and and it made it easier to get the number of signatures they required. But now, now we're saying to them, if you, if you don't ask for more, we're gonna put you on the ballot um, as long as you pro provide us with the information we ask for. All right, more to come on that. More to come. Other, uh, other uh, points from you, Stuart? Uh, yeah, the, the second item that just really occurred to me today, and I've begun, I've contacted the Secretary of State's office. Um, unless something really, really incredible happens over the next several months, more than likely we will be doing our floor meeting via Zoom. Uh, I think that's going to be awkward. You should clarify, Stuart, you mean the town meeting in March. So that's yes. what you're talking about by floor yes. meeting. The annual town meeting, which is the floor meeting portion. We are fortunate uh, because we already vote by Australian ballot. So that's not a problem for us. Many small towns are uh, contacting the league and researching ways that they might hold their vote uh, because they vote everything from the floor. We don't do that. Uh, and there are, I think you might have seen an article in the paper where Shaftesbury is considering a special vote to go to Australian ballot for this year only. Um, and so th that, that's not our problem, but I just wanted to highlight that we will most likely be doing our annual meeting by Zoom uh, uh, for what it's worth. Uh, and then back to my uh, normal manager's report. Uh, I think uh, from an update on the COVID, uh, for our purposes, we have uh, stopped all face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, I think Bruce and, uh, knows that we've, we've uh, forced the policy committees to meet via Zoom or, or some other uh, virtual format. Our planning commission meetings, our staff meetings have all been backed off uh, in part due to the, the governor's uh, new uh, restrictions uh, from the COVID. Uh, and as with Thanksgiving coming, as many of you probably know, uh, multi-household gatherings are prohibited in the state of Vermont. Uh, so it's going to be a very uh, interesting Thanksgiving. Uh, you keep reading about it on the internet and in the newspapers. People are traveling and uh, so it's, it's not something that's easily enforced uh, and we are not going to be, that is the Bennington Police Department is not going to be out enforcing multi-household gatherings by families in Bennington, uh, but the governor has prohibited them and I would ask the public to use extreme caution because this virus is continuing to surge. The numbers are, are moving up very, very quickly, even in the state of Vermont. Uh, and then to follow up on that, I think there was a story a week or so ago about the Y down in Berkshire, down the Pittsfield Y, having to close its doors for a short period of time because a, one of their employees had been found to be positive with COVID. That did not affect the Bennington Recreation Center or any of the personnel in the Recreation Center. So that was not the issue. However, given the governor's recent restrictions, the Y here at Bennington Rec Center has suspended swim lessons. Uh, they have suspended the Marauders and Masters swim team uh, meetings and uh, are using uh, much more caution uh, with the various offerings that they continue to offer uh, to make sure that people are safe when they are participating in uh, 
recreational activities. Uh, we'll try to keep ahead of the, what the governor is requiring, um, but I think it can't be said enough. Wear a mask, socially distance, wash your hands. Um, and even with the vaccine, uh, we are told mid-December, uh, vaccine may be av available to first responders and frontline workers uh, as designated by the uh, state of Vermont. Um, but that will take probably at least four to six months to uh, move out to the rest of our communities. And uh, as usual with vaccines, there may be people who refuse to take the vaccine uh, for their own personal reasons. Uh, but uh, we're probably with this for at least another six to seven months uh, before we start to see some improvement. Um, and then I'll just say this, that the uh, tax collections uh, appeared uh, to be in the high range of normal. Uh, af after the uh, due date, we generally see four to six percent delinquency. Uh, we were at around six percent this year, uh, and we're taking a hard look at uh, how we might uh, determine how COVID had an impact on certain people. I, I have had contact with a number of taxpayers um, that have indicated that due to COVID, they were not able to make their full payment and are probably looking for some sort of help, uh, but I don't have ultimate numbers for that. And I don't have a recommendation for you at this time. Probably will know much more by December 14th. And that's all I've got for tonight. Thank you, Stuart. It looks like there may be a couple of questions for you. Uh, let's keep them brief if we can. First, Jim, and then Gene. Thank you, Stu. Um, with respect to the uh, tax collection, is it uh, in those folks that are late or delinquent, is it confined to a specific part of uh, the Bennington economy? Uh, no, Jim, uh, the, we've had contact with, uh, from residential customers who, whose uh, limited income was, was severely hampered. Uh, Stu. Go ahead. Yes, we, we've had, we've had contact from limited, a limited number of residential customers as well as some of our uh, hospitality uh, customers. Uh, who who have expressed concerns about not being able to meet uh, the their tax uh, the de deadline. So um, I encouraged everyone to pay as much as you could, and uh, we'll take a look at it. And I'll I'll report out to you. And uh, if there is if there is some action that the board should take because of the of the of the uh, COVID uh, impact, then uh, certainly we'll we'll be moving in that direction uh, and have a recommendation for you mid-December, which would be our 14th meeting, I hope. Is it too soon to ask you um, what the projected impact would be on uh, our budget? It's too soon, Jim. Um, uh, I just don't have the numbers for you at this point. Uh, if, if we're looking at simply the penalty, the 8% penalty, which is what most people are concerned about, um, I, ju I just don't have uh, what that might be. Um, and we'll, we'll, we're, Dan and I have been talking about ways that we can come up with a, some sort of an application where, where people are asked to uh, verify that it is the COVID problem uh, we're taking a look at first time delinquencies. We're taking a look at a whole host of things here. Uh, but those numbers take a while to roll in because we have postmarks that we have to get into the system. And uh, we probably won't have that all ironed out until early in December. And that'll allow me to report to you on the 14th. Thank you. Go ahead, Jean Connor. Um, Stu. Um, as far as rolling out the vaccine, have you gotten any indication whether, you know, people in certain 
important jobs like, you know, the highway crew and the water treatment crew, are they going to be getting the vaccine, you know, maybe right after first responders? Potentially. Uh, we, we have talked uh, in, in uh, we know that first responders are first up. Uh, the federal government uh, has been, uh, the CDC has been talking about uh, age relations, uh, uh, difficult medical situations as also ones that might come in, if not first, but in the higher echelons. In Vermont, we have talked uh, with the state about uh, public works employees specifically and especially focusing on water and wastewater employees because we'll need them and we have really we have a relatively small crews that operate our facilities but that's also true throughout the state so we're, we're pursuing that but we don't have an answer at this time. Nancy Lively, it, it, I don't know if it really matters for the purposes of minutes, but we dropped the connection to Sarah Perrin for a while, but she's back in the meeting by phone. Right, I noticed that, thanks. Um, Stuart, thank you for that update. Uh, there's a lot in there. And we, uh, you know, obviously we want to, the tax, the tax thing is critical for us. And so we'll, we'll watch that. We're heading into budget season. So we know that you are nothing if not a sharp pencil man. So keep us, keep us up in the numbers and what we need to know there. Will do. Um, we're going to have a very brief executive session. It turns out it will be very brief board. So don't worry too much about that. But before we go into that, let's uh, do other business. Um, if anyone has anything they'd like to um, bring forward at this point, why don't you, uh, Bruce, do you have anything tonight? I, I do. Um, I happen to go to the uh, farmer's market here in Bennington uh, on Saturday at its new location uh, at the middle school, the old middle school uh, on Main Street. And just wanted to let people know that that's going to be running, uh, I think it's two Saturdays a month. So uh, keep your eyes and ears open for how that works. I think it'll be at least two week uh, Saturdays from uh, last Saturday. Uh, and next it was December really 4th. excellent. Next Pardon one's me? December 4th, I think. Okay, the next one is December 4th. Yeah, that's the date. I just, I was looking and I had everything on November. Sorry. That's great. So I, that's, I just commend them for, for doing that and both for the local farmers as well as for those of us who are consumers. If Walmart can stay open, I think they were quoted as saying, if Walmart can stay open, the farmer's market can stay open. That's <laughs> right. That's like, something like that in the banner yep. today. Yeah. Uh, other, other business comments? Jean, I, Jean Connor, I see you have your hand up. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also just great to see life coming back to the old middle school also. Um, and I just wanted to mention that unfortunately due to COVID and the rise in cases, the Bennington Free Library has gone back to curbside pickup. So the library is no longer open for the time being for the public. Um, they were very, very sad to have to do that, but they felt like they needed to. And I think um, the board all agreed. I did really appreciate getting a call from Lynn at the library asking how they wanted their how we wanted their budget presented this year. Uh, obviously she's thinking a lot about that. Uh, she's crunching her own numbers and really trying to um, run a tight ship there. So look forward to seeing that when it comes to. Um, Jeannie, you've got your hand up. Yes. Um, so it's uh, downtown is looking lovely, particularly if you go down there at dusk or dark. Uh, all the lights are up and it, it is really, it's really beautiful. And I think on top of that, looking at just all the activity and the new, the new stores that are coming in, the new stores that are about to open, the, um, the uh, new, um, the additional things that have happened at the Putnam block. It's really, it's, it's uh, really starting to look like we're, we're getting near the end of, uh, uh, you know, of that phase. Um, everything is just beautiful. So if you haven't been downtown recently, at least drive through it if you can't get out and walk around. So it's great. 
Jim or Sarah, I, I can't see either of your uh, faces, but either of you have anything you want to uh, add before we move into executive session? Yeah, I'll just add that uh, I helped uh, or worked on uh, the hazard pay benefits for the folks at Walmart and uh, really worked very hard with the uh, commissioner for the Department of Financial Regulation to get 101 Vermonters who work for PepsiCo Frito-Lay hazard pay that uh, PepsiCo had just been negligent in uh, trying to get for their employees. So I'm feeling pretty good about that. That's great. Sarah, anything from you? No? Okay. Donald? Yeah. If I, if I could, you kind of jumped over the upcoming agenda. I did entirely uh, jump over it. <laughs> and I just I, I need to get my prescription checked. <laughs> I just want to point out that we will have a, uh, the lead line uh, bonding loan application on the next agenda of the 14th. That's really a, a fairly quick action, but the board must take an action to file the application uh, and then the monies will begin to flow. And uh, the state of Vermont will be making another presentation on the Silk Road uh, roundabout uh, that uh, I think Dan may clarify, but I think that's uh, what they're hoping to do. And then of course, we, we will have the second reading on the policies. Um, and I believe that's all I've got. I've got for we've got, um, well, unless we push them back, we've got the Bennington Police Department coming to talk about uh, their training over the last six months, right? Since um, that's true. It, now I, that may have to be pushed back because okay. um, Paul was just talking to me the other day. Um, uh, Curtis has, has actually been pushing pushing it back. He's been really tied up and hasn't been able to really get together with them. So that that's being okay pushed back okay. maybe into the new year. But I'll 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 get you a better okay answer. perfect thank you. All right. And hopefully you'll have some good news for us on SVC by then too, right? Uh, did, yeah, did, yeah. Did you see That's what all we asked for? That's all I want for Christmas. Did you see where SVHC also made an offer on the gatehouse? Yes. Great. So. Now, all right. Well, well when, you, when you clear executive session, just jot down the time so that I can do the minutes of that, the minutes of okay. them. Will do. It'll just be a couple of minutes. Um, I think I probably speak for the whole board when I say uh, that we know it's going to be possibly the strangest Thanksgiving oh. most of us have ever had. And um, to Stuart's point, it's also during probably the worst part of the pandemic so far. And uh, we hope everybody will stay safe, wear your mask, socially distance, do all that kind of stuff. Probably just going to be this year is going to be the tough one. And so this will be a strange Thanksgiving. Let's hope next year we're, we're back to normal and just uh, hunger down and get through this one the best we can. But whatever you do, uh, we wish you a happy Thanksgiving. Hey, and, Donald. Uh, hey, Donald. What kind of show would you describe it to be this year? <laughs> uh, I have to do that in executive session. <laughs> Uh, it's been a tough show it's been a i tough couldn't show. resist yeah it's right. been a tough show but nevertheless we have to find happiness where we can find it thanksgiving we we still have lots to be thankful for let's dig deep and do it and uh we'll talk to you on the other side so i'd like uh, a, a motion to go into executive session on a personnel matter with no uh voted outcomes during that uh session i'll move right, a second Okay, thank you all in favor, please say aye. Aye. aye.